Hey, welcome to episode 120 of the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicast. In this three-part series, we sit down with two outstanding Americans, Calvin Dockery and Dave Ritchie. Both Calvin and Dave are U.S. Army veterans who flew MH-47 helicopters in the world-renowned 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. The 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment's mission is to organize, equip, train, resource, and employ Army Special Operations Aviation Forces worldwide in support of contingency missions and combatant commanders. Known as Night Stalkers, these soldiers are recognized for their proficiency in nighttime operations. They're highly trained and ready to accomplish the very toughest missions in all environments, anywhere in the world, day or night, with unparalleled precision. They employ highly modified Chinook, Black Hawk, and assault and attack configurations of Little Bird helicopters. Soldiers of the 160th have been actively and continuously engaged since October of 2001. Today, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment continues a sustained and active forward presence in the U.S. Central Command Area of Operations at multiple locations in support of Operations Enduring Freedom. The 160th also provides support to the U.S. Southern, Pacific, Africa, and European commands. Calvin is now a pilot for Alaskan flying the 737 as a first officer, and Dave is now the Chief of Air Operations for the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. In this episode, Dave recounts his involvement as an Army Ranger in Operation Gothic Serpent in Somalia. Many of you know this operation from the movie Black Hawk Down. Dave and Calvin both talk about the 160th selection process and provide some detail on the ship they flew, which was the MH-47 Chinook. The MH-47 differs from its CH-47 sister model with its incorporation of combat systems designed to make the helicopter more survivable on missions deep in enemy territory and during nighttime low-level flight. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Metro Aviation, Shotover, and CNC Technologies. Without their support, these conversations would not be possible. Cheers. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. So southbound, skidding to a stop, stand by here. Looks like they're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, through something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising. Coast four on the stop. Welcome to the Hangar Z podcast. I'm your host today, Jack Shanley. I'm joined by the creator of the Hangar Z podcast, John Gray. John, how are you? Good, sir. Good to see you. Pretty it's cool to hear to you say those words. Host right. of the Hangar well, Z podcast. Well, that's uh, pretty cool. I'm excited about it, but I'm a little nervous. I don't get nervous at much, but I will admit I'm a little nervous. <laughs> All right. Uh, luckily, uh, John's given me a little leeway here and some res- delegated some responsibility, all of which he will regret it within minutes <laughs> of now. But uh, there, there's... It, will, will I regret having you on as the host or am I going to regret having Calvin and, uh, and Dave on? Oh, you're not going to regret that. that that's <laughs> Calvin and Dave are great. You're going to regret giving delegating uh, responsibility to me. <laughs> but uh, but there's a reason for it, which we'll get to here shortly. Uh, so let's just uh, begin by saying we we planned uh, we've been planning this episode for quite a while. Uh, these are, these are two guests that uh, that we really wanted to have on. We considered having them on with Jimmy Hatch in episodes 100 and 101. If you haven't listened to those, you need to because they have a relationship with these two pilots. Jimmy has a relationship with both Dave and Cal. Uh, which we will get to in detail. But uh, we realized it was just going to be too much because all three of these men are amazing, have amazing backgrounds, and uh, have great, great stuff to, to share. So we broke it up, and here we are, and we're, we're thrilled. Uh, so with that said, I'll introduce uh, both our, our guests, our retired uh, U.S. Army. Most of their time was spent in Army aviation, and most of that Army aviation time was spent with Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Task Force 160, the Night Stalkers. Uh, so you'll see, you now know why they have a connection with Jimmy Hatch, who was a Navy SEAL. So with that said, we're going to get into a lot more detail. Uh, welcome to Dave Ritchie and Calvin Dockery. Thanks for coming on, guys. Yeah, welcome, boys. Thanks, Jack and John. Thanks, Jack, John. Good. To, it's really good to have you. Uh, this this is going to be hard because 
we could do an hour on each of these guys uh, just from their bios. I mean, I learned new things uh, in their bios. I've known both these gentlemen for a while, and and I learned new things, really good, fascinating things, and uh, made me even more impressed with both of them. So we'll, we'll get to their bios and, and everything, um, and we'll get to a lot of different topics and of aviation and risk management and uh, Jimmy Hatch's mission. We'll talk about that. But to, to start, uh, John, why don't you, this has been your tradition that you started. Why don't you start us off with, uh, with what you normally do? Yeah. So for, if you listen to the Hangar Z podcast, we always like to start with drink of the day or typically we start with drink of the day. It tends to kick the, the conversation off on a, on a, on a positive note. And uh, to, to start the conversation, um, I've got some, some beers that I got actually from a retirement gift of mine, a friend of mine. I get a, a, a case of beers each month uh, as, re, as my retirement gift. And these beers, they come from all over the country. This one happened to come from Pennsylvania. So as I'm looking at the, at the can, I'm like, Hey, Jack's from Pennsylvania. Yes. I sent him a, a picture of, of the, the can it's Sly Fox is the brewery. And it's out of Pottstown, Pennsylvania. So I'm like, Jack, have you heard of this? You heard of this company? And what would you say it was like 20 or 30 miles from your hometown? Yeah. It's, it's a 30 minute drive from Kutztown. <laughs> it's a Pottstown. Yeah, so it's a, it's a small world. Uh, so, anyways, uh, long answer to a short question. Uh, the drink that I'm starting with is a Volupin IPA out of Pottstown, Pennsylvania. So, that's my drink of the day. And Dave, what are you drinking? I've got two. I got an Alaska Amber here. All right. And because I just got back from a run, which most people would call a quick walk right now, <laughs> at the stage in my life, I got a Lacroix Black Razzleberry. All right, you like that, cow? Razzleberry. I not too long ago started started drinking the the sparkling waters. I guess is is the is the term for them. And so a long time ago, I heard somebody say one time they described sparkling waters as tasting like TV static. And I think that's probably the most accurate description of, of sparkling water I've ever heard. <laughs> TV static, Razzleberry TV static. I like it. <laughs> Calvin, what are you drinking? Well. uh, Part of the show, I just mentioned that I got back from uh, what we also, what we call elk hunting, but it's really poker camp and we overdo it a little bit. So you might be able to see that I'm going with water today, but <laughs> in your honor, I'm going to cap it and have a drink right. of water. Cheers, boys. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> you know, there's water has a place in the drink of the day. Uh, it our, does. Our, it does. Our other co host, Jeff Rakovich, his, his go to is water. So we always joke that that Jeff's our resident water expert. <laughs> yeah. So he'd yeah. be proud that you're representing his shoes with some water. Yeah. I, Jack, I was literally going to bring wild turkey, but I <laughs> couldn't do it today. So you drank it all when you're when you're playing poker. We 100 percent did. <laughs> he, he ran out of Zimas. So. <laughs> <laughs> but Jack, being that you're the host, I know you got something special. What are you drinking? Oh yeah, <laughs> really special. Uh, well, in my hangers -y mug again, I'm drinking water too. And the reason is I got to stay sharp today because you've given <laughs> me this additional responsibility. And uh, I have to stay sharp with these two guests here because I can get <laughs> overrun by them easily. Uh, that you'll see. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but Jeff, I'm drinking water in your honor. Jeff was on a, on a high, highly classified mission uh, to, to Bell Helicopter. And, yeah. And I can tell you that John and I were, are both jealous. We would have liked to have been there doing <laughs> yeah. what Jeff was doing this past week in a Bell 407. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just water for me today. All right. Um, the, the next part of the podcast is typically, we call it the hot seat. So it's just a, an icebreaker scenario that we do. And Jack and I actually didn't talk about this. No. So I don't know if, if you prepare any hot seat questions or, or, or not. Um, Nothing official. <laughs> okay. So, so Jack will ask you a, a couple questions and they're just random questions designed to break the ice and to hear Dave make fun of Calvin a little bit if, if it works out in the way we hope it does. Oh, they'll <laughs> come back the other way, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> way. Yeah, not going to be good. <laughs> Did you have some questions in mind, John? Uh, it's all you today, sir. Oh, let's, look at that. See that? He's delegating and he's putting pressure on me. <laughs> well, uh, I didn't have anything prepared, but I'm just going to wing it and say uh and ask i'll go dave first dave you've been in a lot of airframes in your life what's your favorite airframe even if you had an hour in it 
What's your favorite airframe you've ever flown and why? Oh, it was probably the Chinook. Uh, or the main reason is when we could go places, we could take our vehicles with us. So we always had, you know, the Blackhawk guys, and I flew Blackhawks before, but overseas, all, all the special ops airframes are kind of pigs. You know, they got a lot of stuff on them. But anytime we would jump, they would come begging us to take their bags and stuff. And we'd just be like, well, you know, we got a truck in there. We got all our stuff. <laughs> you know, I don't know if we got the room for it. I'm like, you really don't have enough weight to take your own bags in there. But <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty awesome machine there. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to talk um, more about that. Uh, the Chinook as we go along. I thought that was going to be your answer, but I wasn't, I wasn't positive. There could be something else that slipped in there because you've been around and done some different uh, things. And, and Calvin, how about uh, choice? Q400 yeah, or 737? Ah, well, no, I, it's, it's going to be the MH47, man. It's the best, I think, of the greatest machine to ever fly. But there's a lot of reasons. But, I mean, you're you know flying a helicopter, you guys know. You're low to the ground. Um, you have to stay on it the whole time. There's no autopilot. And uh, you can get up, stretch your legs, move around. You always had, like Dave said, you always had plenty of room for your junk. Um, yeah, it was a great machine to fly and it was, man, things so advanced. I mean, what they yeah. put on it even lately, it's even more advanced. So Cal Calvin, please pay attention to the question. The question was <laughs> Q400 or yeah, 737. Yeah. I know between you like the Chinook. Two, <laughs> Do you miss that Q400? Two, yeah. <laughs> well, not really. No. Okay. <laughs> it just, it retired for a reason. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> When I lived in San Diego, we lived just north of Miramar in Mira Mesa, and the the Chinooks going in and out of Miramar, you know, day day after day, hour after hour, I, every piece of glass that we had in our in our kitchen cabinet would rattle as it fly over, you know, either departing or coming in. So it was just it was just white noise at some point. Those are our sister Chinooks. Those are the little ones. Okay, so that was a Marine Corps base. So those yeah. are the forty sixes. Okay, all right. So let's kick into it here. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth. Some of these questions will be specific to, to one or the other, but we'll go back and forth with these first few. Uh, Dave, tell us about where you grew up at. Just a little bit of a thumbnail of where you grew up and uh, your childhood and how that, how that went. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140 plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. So I was born in Bellflower, California, uh, just outside of L.A. there. Uh, about the age of five, we moved to Kentucky. I was a hillbilly for about five years. Uh, <laughs> up in the hills of Kentucky next to West Virginia, right down from where Loretta Lynn's Holler was. And then moved back to Huntington Beach, California and got my got in a lot of fights first year for the little <laughs> accent I had as a little redneck. But uh, finished growing up in Huntington Beach. I uh, went to Huntington Beach High School. I got there a little bit late, so I couldn't be a surfer. I had kind of a hard time at high school, so decided the Army was probably the best thing for me, about 14 years old. I was going to go in the Army for about four years. Always wanted to be an Airborne Ranger. And then uh, 23 years later, I retired. So he went in as a cook instead. I don't know yeah. if you guys knew that. But... <laughs> I have Ranger Cook, so we actually had one that worked here with me. But I was not a cook, so is that just, you just want to know where he grew up at? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, I, I knew about the Huntington Beach. I didn't know about the Kentucky part. That's interesting. Yeah, I did work for Huntington Beach Police when I was in high school as a cadet, which was an awesome job. I had a couple crappy jobs before that, uh, but that helped line me out for the Army. I was a total like dork for the Army. I hung out at the recruiters from the time I was 14. Yeah. Um, had no aspirations for college. Uh, I didn't do really, really good in high school. Um, I had a very hard time learning. Uh, I blossomed about flight school time where I could actually read and comprehend stuff. But uh, yeah, I joined the Army. And Was there something in your family that, that kind of uh, influenced you or motivated you to, to, to pursue the military? Or is that something you just kind of discovered on your own? I just kind of went that way. I did have a buddy in high school that was in the Rangers. 
And I just started kind of researching that, couldn't get into special forces at the time, and uh, just signed up for the Rangers. So, Calvin, what about you? Tell us your where you grew up at. Yeah, so I grew up in a small eastern Utah town named Vernal, Utah. Uh, really no military presence around there at all, so it wasn't even kind of on my radar at all. But uh, went uh, went to school at Utah State University and got interested in helicopters while whilst there and um, joined the Army right after I graduated. So not 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 as interesting as Dave. I didn't move to Kentucky or anything, but uh, <laughs> no. he went into uh, water support, like Polly Shore. I don't know if you ever saw that movie on the Army. Now that was a uh, Dave and I have known each other for like twenty eight years. So yes, it's obvious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what what, what but, jobs I, did you have before you went to to college, Calvin? Um, well, so before I went to college, I, not a whole lot. I, I mean, I worked at a grocery store. I worked yeah. at Coca Cola bottling factory there Mm -hmm. and then uh yeah so just a couple of short jobs i played sports all through school so i i you know was kind of busy doing that while i was in high school and then the the aviation bug was already in you uh it was not no not at all i so i was i fought wildland fires right uh, while i was in college to put myself through school did that for five summers and uh you know you get flown to fires they fly you up for the Forest Service, at least, they fly you up to the fires and helicopters because usually, you know, it could be a ten mile walk or whatever. Um, so you just you're always flying up and back. And man, I'm looking up the whole time, going, "That looks kind of fun, you know? Looks pretty easy. Doesn't look that smart." So <laughs> <laughs> anybody could do that, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah. And then my my fourth year, I ended up on a helicopter hell repel crew, and that sealed it. I'm like, man, because you you know we had Forest Service pilots that rotated through. And they started, I, I talked to them at length about it. And they're like, yeah, you could do this. It's pretty easy. You just got to join the military. That's the best way to do it. I really didn't want to join the military, honestly. I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I just kind of want to fly helicopters. Do I have to do that, you know, six to eight year part first? Can I just fly these things? <laughs> so I looked into it and, uh, you know, the, the debt, back then the debt to go to private pilot school for helicopters was going to be enormous. And I managed to get through college without almost no debt. So my last year I was on a hotshot crew and, I met a guy that had done the warrant officer program and he's like, that's not that hard. He'd gotten out. So uh, there you go. And literally joined the military with thinking I'll just jump in for six quick years, jump out and go back to work for the forest service flying helicopters. Turns out I liked the military. And 20, how many, how many years later? Like Dave, just, 20? I, I did just over 20. Yeah. My, my yeah. family decided that, that was enough for me. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. Kevin, yeah. I remember reading your bio and thinking I, I did the exact same same thing as you with the Forest Service. I I got hired by the Forest Service when I was uh, 19, I believe I was 19 when I started. <clears throat> and I worked every summer, saved all my money, and spent that. I spent the savings to pay for college. Best way to pay for college ever. Although yeah, it was amazing. You, know, you think about all the all the guys you worked with and girls at the time, they they all had brand new trucks. You know, they they start getting these paychecks and <laughs> you're 18, 19 years old, like holy cow, this is a lot of money. And they come rolling to the station with a brand new truck. And, you know, I'm still driving the old, you know, the old, the old car, yeah. but, you know, I was able to, to utilize that to, to pay for college. And the, the hell attack thing, that was something that I always really wanted to do. In fact, I'm wearing, um, if you guys know Tony Weber, he works for San Diego County Fire. He, uh, he's part of their, their fire search and re- rescue program. He's a pilot in their <laughs> Tony who? The, the burning bush, Tony oh, Weber. Weber. Tony Weber. Oh. <laughs> uh, we so, love Tony Weber. Yeah. Tony Weber's the man. He uh he got me one of the San Diego San Diego County Fire Hell Attack shirts. So they have a really neat partnership with Cal Fire down here in in Southern California and San Diego County in particular. So that they're a, a Cal Fire slash San Diego County asset. So the the county provides the aircraft and Cal Fire provides the Hell Attack crew, which is really interesting. But yeah, that's weird. Yeah, yeah it's it's different. But going back to to what you're saying, that's really cool. You got a chance to do that. And, and just like you, I, that's where kind of the inspiration and desire for helicopters came from was seeing them come in and drop water on fires. That was cool. So it was an incredible job. I loved it. Yeah. So, so Dave, the, the aviation bug, you, you were airborne ranger. That was what in your head for those for through high school. And that's where you went. Uh, when did the aviation bug hit, hit you? Was it when you were a ranger? Uh, no, really never did. I mean, uh, it's kind of weird. You know, I was in the Rangers, went to combat, 
kind of looked ahead. I wasn't going to be in a combat for a long time. Um, I got divorced uh, when I was at Fort Benning and when I was in the Rangers and wanted to kind of clear myself out of there. And I was in the Re Ranger Regimental Headquarters at the time in the recon section. I was about six years in at that point and saw there was an assignment to San Diego and went out with the SIL teams and Marine Re Reconnaissance course out there. And after about two years out there, there's three Rangers out there that helps with buds or helps with the recon course. Um, I was like, crap, I really don't want to be a first sergeant. You know, I don't want to tell people to blouse their boots and all that. And the other thing, uh, I spent the majority of my time with the, uh, the Marine reconnaissance school there. And I was looking around and I was like, this guy was getting two knee replacements. This guy was getting back surgery. This guy needed a hip replacement. It's like, holy crap, man. I don't want to be on a wheelchair. You know, what can I do? And someone was like, Hey, you can go be a pilot. I was like, really? You think they're going to let me be a pilot? Um, I think it helped. I was one of the few people at the time that had combat that, uh, they let me in flight school. And after that, you know, it's kind of like the best rank in the world. You're in charge when you're flying, when you come back, you give it to the lieutenants and the captains and you do that warrant officer thing and just kind of disappear as much as you can, right? Wear civilian clothes, act like you're not in the army, make fun of a bunch <laughs> of people and just hide it out. <laughs> what, let's, let's sl slow down one notch and, and talk about your, your Ranger time. Uh, what, tell us a little bit more about uh, the Rangers and specifically uh, one of the most significant parts of your life uh, was when you were a ranger with um, Gothic Operation Gothic Serp. And talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so when I went in the Army, uh, it was 1991, uh, went through whatever, infantry, airborne, uh, ranger indoctrination, and uh, signed into Bravo Company, 3rd of the 75th Ranger Regiment. We did about two years, went through ranger school, went through some other, other courses, and then uh, ended up in Somalia. Uh, and I think the most memorable thing about that was uh, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody. We got to send one letter to our parents when we were at Fort Bragg before we left. So uh, my mom was protesting to get me back. So she had a big Ranger sticker on the back of her car and a big poster that said, call the White House, get our kids out of Somalia. My brother had to go to her and tell her, you know, you either take that out of your window or take that sticker off your car. Um, no, it was super memorable. I was on one of the Jeep teams. Uh, just about everybody got shot. But uh, the biggest thing I don't like about the missions, the way it's portrayed, I mean, uh, at, that, at that point, nobody, you know, the way the, the climate was, was, you know, we can't lose anybody. If we lose anybody, it's a failure. Like we accomplished every one of our missions we did over there, even that day. They just weren't willing to lose helicopters and 18 people and all that. But it was a totally, you know, we, we accomplished our mission that day. It was a shutdown after that. And that, that day being the, the day of what most Americans know as Black Hawk Down, the day of Black Hawk yeah. Down, which, which is very significant in many levels, but certainly significant to you. Tell us, tell our audience why it's i mean even that day is extremely significant to you i know there's multi levels to it but talk talk about that thank you to our sponsor shot over shot over systems is the leading developer and manufacturer of high performance gyro stabilized cameras with advanced real-time ar mapping and mission management all backed by unparalleled custom training and support now offering the M2 multi-sensor system, Soul 6 axis EOIR platform with 4K Ultra HD color and infrared technology, ideal for law enforcement and defense. Offered with real-time AR overlays to quickly identify streets, weather, and traffic. Automated license plate recognition, 24 megapixel digital photographs, and automated steering and tracking. I mean, I think, you know, that that's probably where I got a little bit of my flying bug in me. I always saw those guys and kind of looked up to them. Uh, they're always kind of untouchable. And then, you know, once I met Cal, I mean, I touched them all the time, you know. So <laughs> I realized, you know, they're not that untouchable. But, yeah, my roommate, my best friend, I mean, he was the first person killed in there. If you watch Black Hawk Down, that's yeah. 
Sergeant Dominic Pilla, uh, he was really the first one killed. Uh, it was pretty, uh, you know, traumatic for all of us at that point, but very much, um, you know, the great thing is train as you fight. I mean, we were literally, I don't want to say tortured, but you know, we went through a lot. So when we were actually there, it, it was somewhat, I don't want to say it was easy, but it was, your training was so intense that, you know, the, the great thing is nobody's yelling at me and waking me up at two o'clock in the morning to take out a piece of trash. <laughs> to a trash can that's a half mile away you know i'm able to sleep at night and that's all i gotta worry about is getting shot at that point yeah they just uh i didn't go this year but it was the 30th anniversary this year yeah um so we're still in contact with a lot of guys in the last hai i went to uh they're they're gracious enough and my chief pilot was gracious enough and he's a 275 ranger uh, i had a couple of black hawk down buddies i got a strong the night before we came back Joke on them, I had COVID and gave them all COVID uh, <laughs> on the way back from HAI. So, now, you said everybody got shot. That included you, Dave. Yeah, right? I got trapped. Yeah, I got trapped on me and a little, little, little memento. Yeah. Um, I thought it was funny because I went to get an MRI last year and couldn't get one because when I went in, you know, I put in there, I had that shrapnel at some point. Well, I never did that before with the MRIs I had before, and I had like eight at Fort Rucker after I quit, like Calvin said. Uh -huh. uh, my, <laughs> mind you, Calvin has 20 years. I got 23, so I'm good about the same amount of time. No time in the regiment. Well, it matters. That's right. <laughs> but when I got those other MRIs, I did have another piece of shrapnel come out when I was at the Army Flight School because uh, they did not ask me to get x-rays there before I actually had an MRI. So Wow. <laughs> and that was sitting in there for 20 or so years. So yeah, it was just like a little, little piece of metal. Wow. So, Very so this low. is a G rated show. If you, after I, we get done with this, I can tell you about the first time that I got to see Dave's well, bullet wound. It's funny shower. you say that. <laughs> it's funny you say that. Cause that was one of my questions. How, Calvin, how did you first <laughs> see that, that Dave had a, an injury, a wound from that day? And is it true that it was in a shower? <laughs> so in walk school, you know, everything's a blur. You're just, you're taking like, I don't remember how much they gave us like six minutes to shower or something like that. And there's what, well, there was like 70 of us. There was a lot of, so you do walk showers. You, you have to get in, you get wet, then you get back out and you put your soap on <laughs> while you're putting your soap on the other guys getting in, getting wet and you, and you, and then you get back in and I don't, I think I must've been soaping up, right? <laughs> I'm bent over. And Dave had just gotten in, and I kind of looked up a little bit, and his right buttocks cheek is right here. <laughs> and he said, want to see my bullet wound? <laughs> All I can remember is I think I punched him in the cheek. <laughs> and then I had to get back to showering because we were out of time. <laughs> so it is well, true. I did always... It is, it, he, he, you know, he got shot in the back of the ass. And the only way to get shot in the back of the ass is running away. So oh, I don't know. Oh, boy. I don't know. know. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have been accusatory. I've, been, I've accused him for 20 some odd years now of running away when he got shot. <laughs> and quitting. And yeah. Quitting. Uh, I, see, and I quitting. see Dave loading up over there. I want to see if oh, yeah, I'm, he's I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm good. He's ready. He's always locked and loaded. He's ready. <laughs> one, run, one run away. One run away. So uh, <laughs> it is a good story, though. His, his butt was hanging down inside. Yeah, it was. Wild. It is a great so, story. Thus, that's why you, we asked it. You know, you had it is you had a round that hit you in the butt stock for a long time. I don't know where that went, but yeah, that's that's I still have that. I mean, one of them, one of the rounds caught the butt stock, but he was you know yeah, so. That's a buttstock, my M60 there with two AK rounds, sir. Very fortunate to be here. That's um, what what a day. Uh, shifting gears back over to Calvin here. No more yeah. shower stories, Calvin. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about your entry uh, into into the army and and what what was the sequence of events that got you uh, up into aviation. Well, so yeah, I you know I, I decided I was going to do the army thing. I, my, my wife and I, when well, we were engaged at the time and she said, yeah, let's do it. So, um, I decided to, to join the army at the time they were, they were offering those 15 year retirements. It was during that bad time during the Clinton years when they were offering early retirements to people. So they weren't taking anybody straight off the street. 
like they normally did. And it was only about a year that they stopped that. But get in a hurry, I decided to to join him, you know, because you can you can enlist, get in your enlistment and then take the fast test and all that stuff. And I didn't want to wait around for a year and a half, two years. And so I joined and the recruiter kind of duped me a little bit, you know, as recruiters do. Um, probably told me what some of the truth and some of I wanted to hear. But either way, I ended up in a um, an MOS that was a year long or AIT that was a year long. So the commander there wouldn't let me take the test. So I had to go all the way through that year long AIT, the training you go through in the army before I could even take the fast test. And I got to my unit and I'm like, well, just my first unit. I just, I'll just chill out for a little bit. And about three months later, my wife's like, tick tock, dude, we got, we got stuff to do. So, um, I throw it all in, got, you know, about three months later, I was in place. It wasn't very long, but, you know, it was long enough. I probably would, it would have been faster. Like, I think we went through flight school with some guys that came straight in. So I would have been faster if I had just waited, and, you wow. know, probably went straight in, but that's okay. I mean, I grad, I graduated eight days later, I was married and like a month later I was in the military. So. And what, what, what were you flying and where initially after training, I guess. Yeah, Dave and I went through Canada school together, a good chunk of uh, our primaries together, all that stuff. And uh, I want to back up a little bit. He did say, you know, I wasn't very good at high school, but Dave and I were like top of our class academically all the way through. Like, so he might throw out, he might play a good game of like, I'm a dummy, but yeah, he's not. So <laughs> I um, know that. I, I've known that uh, a long time. Yeah. So smart, guy, smart dude. <laughs> <Shit up. laughs> but, well, back up, back up one more step. How, yeah. how did you two meet? Waiting to go to the army, I watched a documentary on the Discovery Channel, the invasion of Panama, and Pablo Escobar and the Rangers were in that. And I'm yeah. like, I actually went to my fiance at the time and said, I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to join the Rangers first. And then I'll, and she's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're not going into the army for you to play army. You're going to go in to fly. So, yeah. so, but um, yeah, so that's where we met in flight school or, um, okay. or candidate school, I guess, right? I think Got it was it. summertime of, of oh, 98, I think, right? Yeah, got it. But um, yeah, for me, I went, uh, I'll, everything was based on, I met, well, I found out about the 160th from Dave and a couple other guys in, in flight school. And at the time I'm like, that's all I've been reading was aviation books, helicopter books, Vietnam mostly. And when I found out about the 160th, I'm like, I got to do that. I, like, I have to be in that unit. Yeah. And uh, so that kind of changed things for me. So everything that I, cho- I chose Chinooks, I didn't want to fly Chinooks, I chose Chinooks because I met a couple of guys uh, while I was down there. They were in the advanced course. Um, they were 160th guys. And they're like, choose Chinooks. It's the fast track into the, into the uh, regiment. And I didn't know why, but I do now. Because for the most part, the Chinook was kind of a, there was a transition going on in the army. It was like really, really old guys. And then some new guys. And the really old guys were there because they didn't want to really, they didn't want to work too hard. How's that? And so they had a hard time. The regiment had a hard time getting Chinook folks in flying, the true Chinook people flying Chinooks. And so that was why it was a fast track. And you know, it's like about a, you know, they said you can two or three years in, at your unit and you can apply and come and versus five, six, seven years flying Blackhawks or Little Birds, which is what I really wanted to fly was Little Birds. I'm like, I don't want to wait that long. You know, it's, I got to get there now. And then, um, so yeah, I chose the Chinook and there was only a couple of them offered. But I went straight to Korea right out of that, spent a year there, came back to the 101st. And I had been in the 101st for all of a couple months when Chad Dominique, another buddy of mine and Dave's, um, went, and he picked up our packets because I'd said I wanted to do it. And so he delivered my packet to me. And yeah, I had that packet in hand when September 11th, well, you know, I was in the process of building it out when September 11th happened. So yeah, tell, tell us more about that application uh, around se- September 11th, how that worked for you. Well, so for me, uh, you know, it's a, Back then, it was before a lot of computerized forms, so it's all hand stuff. You're, you know, you're walking forms around, and you're looking up what is DA form fourteen twenty eight, you know, and, and you're typing it on an old typewriter and stuff like that. Well, you might be, I think some of it might have been computerized at that time, but you still had to look these forms up, and it wasn't easy. Um, so I was kind of in the process of filling it out, but I only had it for like maybe two weeks, and September eleventh happened, and the recruiter, Rick, um, he. He called about two weeks later and said, hey, man, uh, I need you to get that packet in. And I'm sure he called Chad as well. And I said, well, I just found out the 101st is we're going to war. Like this is the might have been three weeks later, but we found out that a brigade was going and Chinook, you know, our ship Chinook 
company was going to go over with that brigade. And I'm like, man, the war's going to end. Like I, I said, no, I, I have to do, I have to get this in. I don't know if I'm going for sure, but I will find a way to get there. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not turning the packet. And he's like, man, I can make that two year ad. So go away, just turn it in. You'll be over here in like a week. They, he had, you know, they had magic abilities right after nine 11 for assessment selection. And uh, now granted, I would have had to still go, you know, through selection and assessment. And then if I've made it then I'd come back and go to training, but he just wanted to, to get me over there to at least uh, assess. But I, I wanted to go to, I mean, I for sure wanted to go. And I did, I begged, borrowed and stole my way to go with a different company uh, over there and, you know, realized, wow, I do not like being part of this big army so much anymore. So <laughs> yeah, I, I turned, I, my packet got turned in within days of my redeployment from, it was a six month deployment back then. Uh, and we got back summer of 02 and I had my packet turned in a matter of days. That's, I think my assessment was like a month and a half later or something like that. Wow. For and Dave, oh, go ahead, John. I've always been enamored by the 160th. And I know a lot of our listeners, most of our listeners probably know what the 160th is. But for the for the folks that don't, can you talk about the 160th? And, you know, it's 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 a it's an elite unit. And can you talk about, you know, how you get selected? And you've kind of talked about that through the, the packet you turned in. But and then, you know, once you're selected and you start actually in, in, deploying on, on missions with the 160th, what that looks like and, you know, what sets what sets you guys apart from, you know, the, the traditional aviation units in the Army. Thank you to our sponsor, CNC Technologies, CNC Technologies, serving law enforcement, government and military markets with tailored mission solutions, system training, and live 24-7 support with cnc.live platform. Explore more at cnctechnologies.com. Yeah, man. So uh, I think you, you can assess or you can fill out a packet. So what you do is you get your packet in hand, and um, it takes you a few weeks nowadays, probably quicker than that, to, fi- to get it all fi- filled out, get your commander signature off on it. You turn it in, and if they like what they see, um, they will call you for... Uh, an assessment. You'll come down and uh, it's somewhere between like what, six to eight days, Dave, is that about right? Depending on selection. Yeah, about a week. They'll fly you in from wherever you're at. Guys, if you're stationed in Germany, they'll fly you in and you you go through a, uh, a, you know, you do a a physical test, a swim test, which that's probably people don't understand the significance of the swim test until you go do it. (laughs) It's a, what is it? A Navy class three swim test or something like that? It's basically a floating test. So I mean, but if you don't know how to float, you're gonna drown. Yeah. So it's not hard. There's techniques, but you, you, all, what you're doing is you almost black out multiple times, and they say uh, you you come close enough to blacking out without blacking out. That's good. But if you just quit, get out of the pool, right. and, and you're done for the most part. But yeah. um, it's not hard. You figure it out later on. But once you get done with that, if you select, a, um, you go through the week long assessment. You're 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 getting you're giving a class. You're taking a psych test. It's just multiple psych tests. You're, um, you're flying in a simulator, then you're presenting your class. You're given a class on something plus or minus five minutes, plus or minus 30 seconds. Once you get done with that, uh, you, you go out and fly in your aircraft and you're, you know, you're hitting a couple targets. You, you plan it, brief it, and, um, then you execute it, hitting a couple targets plus or minus 30 seconds, which is the paper map. There's, you know, an accomplice. That's it. Um, it, and then you, I think the very last thing is you get, that's when you give your class, sorry, you, you give your class at that end and then you go through a board and there's several people, including the instructor pilot, which Dave and I both were. So you would set in on that. You, you're the guy giving the assessment later on. And it's quite fun when you're on the other side of the table, right? But when you're the guy sitting there, it's not so fun. Uh, you feel like the whole world's against you and it's, but it's, it's part of it. It's, it's just a, it's a rite of passage. And quite honestly, uh, it's, it's not designed to fail, but it's almost impossible to ace. Yeah. Um, what they want to see is, uh, well, if, you know, I've been out for seven years now, but what they did want to see was you don't quit. You've got a good attitude and you, and you have the ability to learn. So, yeah. and that's, and this is really all what you in, look that, at. in that one week assessment. Yeah. All you of, get no sleep. That's yeah. A lot. You're and, and it's, it's, it's quite lengthy. Yeah. You don't get a whole lot of sleep. Um, and then once you get done with that, uh, you go back to your unit. If you select this uh, positively, they, they bring you back and uh, you start the training program. When Dave and I went through it, it was seven months. I think they shifted it to six months. They condensed some stuff. But uh, if you're already rated in the Chinook, it's six months. Um, but if you're not, they, you have to go learn how to fly the Chinook because they, like I said, they take 
a lot of guys in other in other units, they'll bring them into the Chinook and fly that. So Dave, yeah, patchy guys, uh, OH-58 guys or whomever. And yeah, then you go through that. And once you get to the, uh, you through all that long training pipeline, which you just learn all the mission profiles, which is an insane amount of stuff you learn, aerial refueling, fast rope approaches, that multi-mode radar, you're learning to fly off the ground in the clouds a hundred feet. You know, and with your butthole tuck, you know, puckered up like that the whole time, <laughs> you know, goggles kicked up at dark and you're like, well, this is the dumbest thing ever, <laughs> but you're flying along the train. And then, uh, and you come back to the unit and for us, uh, we would pretty much, you planned on deploying when we were in combat, you within the first 90 days, you'd be gone on your first deployment. And then you had to do at least, I think, was it two or three BMQ rotations, basic mission qualified rotations over there. Uh, which were about 60 days apiece. And then uh, in that 18 to 24 months, and then you would take an FMQ, fully mission qualified check ride, where um, the, the 160th is an odd organization in that if you're flying customers, which are you know special operations forces, you have to have a flight lead in the left seat of the lead Chinook, uh, an FMQ, which has been around for a while, flying in the right seat. And then the air mission commander was typically in the jump seat. And then Everybody behind you, chocks two, three, four, et cetera, um, was an FMQ, BMQ mix. So you have to pass that second or that first check ride, which is your FMQ check ride, to move to the left seat and fly with a new guy, if you will, who's a BMQ. And uh, that's just basically to make sure we've got proficient crews throughout, spread out throughout the, the force. Dave, that's generally what, how it works. At, at what point, Dave, did you, in that process, are you told – this is the airframe you're going to be in. Is it part of the, at the end of the assessment or is it during uh, the green platoon training? Uh, mine was a little different. I actually assessed for Blackhawks and then went into it. Uh, but at that time was right about when I wreck kicked off. So the recruiter, I went through assessment, got picked up for Blackhawks, but the recruiter was, uh, he was an instructor pilot on the uh, DAP 60s, the DAP Blackhawks, which are the gunship ones. Well, he deployed with the battalion I was going to and never told the adjutant that, hey, we need to get this guy out of his unit. Because I was fighting with my career manager at the time, the uh, Army career manager at the time, just like sending guys from the 160th to Korea. Because this is a little bit after 9-11, so the 160th is playing nice with the Army now. Um, so I called the adjutant that. And he's like, no, I didn't hear anything about you, man. And he's like, I'll get you orders in like 18 to 24 months. And I was like... Awesome, man. You got me a, a way one way ticket to Korea, you know, and I'm not going to get tracked to instructor or whatever. And I was like, uh, I'm not saying anything, but like, if I go to Korea, I'm never coming there. Um, and I said, I heard this guy Cal fly Chinooks. I mean, I'm at least as good as him. Can you get me into Chinooks, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, I heard that. They uh, they were asking most of the people at that time but just because, you know, the Chinooks for the bigger picture was the show in Afghanistan and Afghanistan was the show. Uh, there, were, there weren't a whole lot of Blackhawks or Little Birds. They would come in, but, you know, that was if we're in the valley floor somewhere and they had a little mission, you know, they could carry about 20 minutes of fuel and three people. And so the, the regiment at that point went very heavy Chinooks. So, you know, I've bit my tongue at that time and became a Chinook pilot. So was the main was the main reason that that changed to the Chinook uh, being the the key platform? Was it the the elevation that that you were working at, or was it the the number of people that you were going to be transporting for the mission in Afghanistan? What was the what were the factors that that changed from the emphasis kind of going to the Chinook? It was pretty much. I mean, it was, all that it was the elevation, the temperature, the amount of people you needed to take. Um, Iraq kicked off, so, you know, having smaller aircraft there were definitely, you know, a benefit there. So, I mean, there were there were times, and Cal, Cal can attest to it, five, six years, the Chinooks were the only ones in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. You know, they would come back for, you know, some little missions here and there, but for the most part, until Iraq shut down, it was, it was us. I mean, yeah. We were just left kind of to rot in Afghanistan for about 10 years. <laughs> so we just literally went, I mean, me and Cal, you know, and everybody else went two, three, four times a year. You know, I went anywhere from seven days to 
77 days, which is probably the worst one. And me and Cal was on that for yeah. <laughs> the, fir the first rotation we had for the new battalion. We hope, sir. Yeah. So perfect lead in uh, for both of you. <laughs> tell, tell us about the, ch the Chinook. Tell us about the number of, number of crew, uh, uh, the, the speed that what it can handle, the, the payload, uh, the max gross, all that stuff. Go, go take, walk us through the, the MH 47. Cal, you want to do that? I probably broke more than cow, but you know. <laughs> Dave left more landing gear on the mountainside than I did. So uh, I never left. I never left them on the. I always brought them back. So <laughs> yeah, well, you brought the one back to a canyon because uh, yeah, I was I mean, it was, you, but, uh, That was Macaulay that lost that one. <laughs> oh, it was. That's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the MH forty seven is a little different than the, the CH forty seven in the fact that it's got a lot of stuff slung on it. Right, it's got uh, multi mode radar, FLIR probe the bigger tanks lots of more um survivability equipment a whole lot of things on there the armor throughout it and so i think it's uh, was it six to eight thousand pounds heavier than a regular chinook isn't the chinook one of the fastest ro rotary helicopters in the military yeah i mean it's considered the fastest for level flight like the bnas of the apache and blackhawks are actually faster but they can only do it in a dive like the <laughs> The Chinook physically can go faster than its VNE and, e and maintain level flight. It's just, you know, you're probably going to hit something. One thing that's uh, unique about the Chinook, unlike other helicopters, is their transmissions actually move. They program, and that's so it doesn't fly like this across the way. So those things can only program so far forward um, because if the back one programmed anymore, it would just hit the, the tunnel covers on there. So it's 170, but you could do that all day long. Where anything else, you're you're going to be falling out of the sky. We would regularly leave our uh, CAS escort, like if, we, if it was a DAP or or um, the Apaches, we would be walking away from them. You know, as we're we'd be cruising along, and everybody's just doing fine. They would call and go, "Hey, can you guys slow down? We're, we're we can't keep up." <laughs> I mean, it was regular, so we would have to slow down and like, oh, "Come on, guys!" But yeah, crew of if ours was a crew of six, so two pilots. And four in the back. So we had uh, four crewmers. We had an FE, who was typically the right gunner. And uh, then we had, you know, three crew chiefs, men in the other guns. So the, up front was two M134 miniguns. They were 3,000 round a minute DC miniguns. Uh, switched after Al Max incident up there. They used to be AC, but, you know, after that aircraft went down, they realized that they probably need battery powered guns. Tell us, and then, tell, uh, tell the audience what you're talking about there, Cal. Oh, the, Al Mack. The, yeah, that was, yes. he was the, he wrote a book and I'll, I'll pitch it if I, if I can, can I pitch please, it here? Please do. Yeah, it's called Razor Zero Three, A Night's Doctor's War. It's an amazing book, mostly because I'm in it. Um, <laughs> I got, <laughs> Dave did not get in it. Just throwing it out there. But what uh, the heck, he, <laughs> he might've, but uh, yeah, he, he was one of the primary flight leads, a group up in Uzbekistan flying the horse soldiers across uh, on the very first missions into Afghanistan. And they, they, you know, they moved down and eventually down to Bagram. And that's when they did Operation Anaconda was when um, they were putting in all the, the SEAL elements and the recce elements up above, it kind of setting the stage for set the conditions for the, the 101st to do their big mission. And, uh, you know, they, I was going in to land on a hilltop and uh, there was, <laughs> they thought it was an empty hilltop around 10,000 feet. And it was you know, 20 or some odd uh, Taliban enemy forces up there. And they just opened fire. And as Al, Al, just started to touch down the ramp went down and neil roberts had unclipped already you're not supposed to unclip until the ramp's down all for it but he had unclipped a little bit early and as al took off to do a go around he slipped and fell on the ramp and that's how so roberts ridge yes so they, they called it the battle of roberts ridge right that's what his book is about but it's about a lot of other things but um so how, how did that relate to the ac uh, dc the, uh, the, oh yeah uh, so that's the uh, so when he yeah he got he got lit up pretty good there. They lost hydraulics. They lost a lot of things. If you read the book, it's pretty fantastic. But the fact that they ended up on the ground is a miracle. And their crew chiefs in the back saved their lives. I mean, they they didn't they never stopped. They ne they literally poured hydraulic fluid into the the unit and was pumping it to give him enough controls to get let stubble back out again, pour more in. And he they finally said, hey, this is the last one. I'm pumping. Because if you don't land soon, this is all we got. They got on the ground. I think the, the high flight control hydraulics locked up for the last time within wow. seconds of them getting on the ground. But um, when they were on the ground, they realized quickly that, hey, we don't have any DC miniguns. When Chuck Gant and the rest of the guys came in with the Rangers shortly thereafter to get 
Roberts off the top of the hill. They got shot down for real up there on that hill with no mini guns. And it would have been nice to have mini guns because once the aircraft powers turned off, you know, when the, you know, the AC power turns off, they weren't, it wasn't working anymore. So they, they realized we needed DC battery powered guns. And it wasn't long after that day, maybe we had them when we first got there, but I want to say by 05 or something like that, we went around 05, 06, we moved to the DC mini guns yeah. because initially they were, they were AC and they were, they were, they cycle between a 2000 and 4,000 minute rate of fire. And the crew chief, you know, they would always start low and, and I mean, <laughs> just blast your ears when we did it, yeah. but they did it on the regular. And these ones, the, the DC mini guns just were straight up uh, 3000 rounds a minute. Wow. And then the back two crew chiefs in the back were um, 240D gunners. So we had six or four total guns on the airplane. Yeah. How, how else, Dave, talk about how else that crew in a, in a, aircraft as large as the Chinook, how that crew in the back assisted you as a pilot to do your job and to, to particularly land and take off in, in some very interesting places. This is the end of part one. Be sure to join us for part two, where we continue the conversation with Calvin Dockery and Dave Ritchie. They go into detail on how they know Jimmy Hatch, who is our guest from episode 100 titled Touching the Dragon. Stay tuned after a word from our sponsors for some insights on upcoming episodes. Cheers. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Thank you to our sponsor, Shotover. Shotover Systems is the leading developer and manufacturer of high-performance gyro-stabilized cameras with advanced real-time AR mapping and mission management, all backed by unparalleled custom training and support. Now offering the M2 multi-sensor system, Soul 6 axis EOIR platform with 4K Ultra HD color and infrared technology. Ideal for law enforcement and defense. Offered with real-time AR overlays to quickly identify streets, weather, and traffic, automated license plate recognition, 24 megapixel digital photographs, and automated steering and tracking. Thank you to our sponsor, CNC Technologies. CNC Technologies, serving law enforcement, government, and military markets with tailored mission solutions, system training, and live 24-7 support with CNC.live platform. Explore more at cnctechnologies.com. Hey, thanks for sticking around to hear from our sponsors. Without our sponsors, these conversations would not be possible. After the three-part series with Calvin and Dave, we get back to our conversation with our friends from Wingman Med. During the conversation with them, we discuss an article written by Dr. Dan titled, Top 10 Ways to Fail Your Next FAA Flight Medical Exam. You'll not want to miss this conversation. Cheers and Merry Christmas. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.